this is now part four of the series that we've been dealing with, dealing with the subject of choices. Somebody say choices. choices. It's been in a series that we have been discussing, dealing with the fact that we have to admit to, we have to own up to, and understand our choices. We all know that some choices are easy to make, whereas there are some that are quite difficult. Uh, there are some choices that when you make them only impact that day, but some choices that we make can affect you and follow you the entirety of your life. What is choice? What is it to choose? To choose is to select from a number of possibilities. When you choose, you pick by preference. To choose is to prefer or decide to do something. To choose is to want, it is to desire. When you choose, you select freely and after consideration. In the course of a day, you will make many, if not several, choices. You choose what you're going to wear that day. You choose what you're going to eat for lunch, what you're going to have for breakfast, what you may have for dinner. You even may choose the route that you're going to take going to school or to work. We're constantly and have been continually reminded by God in this series that God doesn't force you to do anything. That God leaves it up to you and your free will to choose to love him. God does not force you to obey him. He wants you to make that choice on your own and decide to obey him out of your own, again, free will. God, he taught us some things over this series thus far, and these are some of the things that we've learned about choices. Your choices say a lot about who you are. Your choices, if you examine a person's choices, you'll determine just kind of where they are, not only with themselves, but where they are with their relationship with God. We also learned that uh, you have to, at some point, own up to your choices. At some point, you have to admit to some of the decisions you have made in your life. We're going to deal with that a little bit later. We also were taught that you should never, ever make a hasty choice. You should always have careful consideration about things before you decide to do them. You also should never, ever, ever make an emotional choice. The last thing you want to do is make a lasting decision on a temporary emotion. You can be mad today and okay tomorrow, but if you make a decision when you're mad, that mad decision can impact your life that for years to come. We also learned that you should never make a choice based on somebody else's choice. Just because they like a thing doesn't mean you're going to like a thing. Just because they want a thing doesn't mean that you'll want it. So we got to be careful about the choices that we make. We also learned that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and many of us have made choices with our mouths. We've made choices about how we're living based on the words that we say. Your words have power. And when you keep telling someone that you are broke, then what happens is your words be begin to create the world that you are now living in. So you got to be careful and choose your words wisely. And then on last week, God uh, helped us because he shared with us on last week that we have to be careful and we have to pick a side and make a choice and choose God. Jesus himself said in Revelation 3, I would rather you be hot or cold. I can deal with you if you're cold and you want nothing to do with me. Jesus said, I can deal with you when you're hot and you're excited about me. But Jesus said, I can't deal with the lukewarm believer. I can't deal with them folks that got one foot in today and got a foot out tomorrow. Jesus says, I vomit those kind of people out of my mouth. Because Jesus says, I could rather deal with you when I know where you stand. But when you're wishy-washy, Jesus says, I can't handle folks like that. You're either going to be with God or you're not going to be with God. You're either going to serve God or you're not going to serve God. But one way or another, you've got to make a choice and you've got to stick with that choice. 
But today, today, as we go into today's message, there are going to be some quotes that we're going to share with you in a couple of moments here that are going to kind of lay the theme for where God is going to take us today. Elizabeth Kubleros, she said this, she said, I believe that we are solely responsible for our choices. And we have to accept the consequences of every deed word and thought throughout our lifetime. Alfred A. Manterport said this, he said, nobody ever did or ever will escape the consequences of his choices. And I believe James E. Faust sums it up clearly when he said, in this life, we have to make many choices. Some are very important choices, some are not. Many of our choices are between good and evil. The choices we make, however, determine to a large extent our happiness or our unhappiness because we have to live with the consequences of our choices. With that being said, uh, our subtitle for this part four of the Choices series is exactly that, the consequences of your choices the consequences of your choices. Now, uh, God has already prepared me that it may get a little quiet today, but that's okay. There may be times where God says, you won't hear an amen, son. I said, okay, God, but God says, I want you to minister this word today. We're going to use the prophet Jonah as a backdrop for today's message. And it's the story of the prophet Jonah that when I was a child growing up, it was preached in such a way that it came across as a story of survival. When Jonah was preached, when I was coming up at the old College Avenue Baptist Church, it was preached in such a way that it would have you to think that Jonah was just caught up in a bunch of trouble that he didn't ask for. Well, after further examination, what we're going to find today is this prophet's story is a story of consequences of the choices that he made. As we begin teaching this, this word today, we're going to continue to find through Jonah and his life that he made some decisions and based on those decisions, he had to deal with the consequences of those decisions. Look with me at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, look at this, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Now, in order to get proper context for where we're going, you've got to understand what Nineveh is, the type of city it was, and the type of people that lived in it. Nineveh was at this time the metropolis of the Assyrian monarchy. It was a great city with a great number of inhabitants. Nineveh, Nineveh now, was great in wealth. The prophet Nahum, in a couple of books down the road here in the Bible, if you read Nahum chapter 2, verse 9, Nahum describes Nineveh as a city that had no end of its store. What did he mean by that? In other words, what he said was Nineveh was a city in a nation that had great wealth. They had very little lack. They had more than enough. This great city, though, was also a dominant city. It was great in dominion. At some point in time, this city and the Assyrian nation ruled over the entire earth. Catch this. You've got to understand this. Just like any other superpower, Nineveh and Assyria, they were and were established and under God's rule and judgment. Do understand this, though. Every nation has a period of time where they have great power. Just like the Greek nation had great power and rule but fell, so did the Assyrian nation have great rule, but it also fell. But also know this about Nineveh. It was not only a great city with great people and great power, but it was a sinful city. This city did not know God, did not want to know God, did not even care to worship the true and living God. This city was a wicked city. Nineveh 
was comprised of particularly vile people. They would, if you were their enemies, they would skin you alive. And understand this about Ninevites and Israelites, there was no love loss between the two. Nineveh at the time was a modern day sin city. I guess you could say whatever happened in Nineveh stayed in Nineveh. It was the type of city that all manner of sin took place. And yet God was to send a prophet, an Israelite, to Nineveh to preach a word of deliverance. God was to send a man to Nineveh into a place that didn't like people like him. It's like sending a black man to racist white man to preach the word of God. It's like sending a dire enemies to one another in order to convince them that God wants to save their souls. And so God, God speaks to Jonah in verse 1. He says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. And cry out against it. Watch this. For their wickedness has come up before me. So it's quite clear that God wants Jonah to go to Nineveh. His instructions were very clear. God did not mince any words. God did not stutter. He wanted the prophet Jonah to go to Nineveh. There is no gray area here. He says, arise and go to that place with those people I know you don't like. Good God Almighty. But look at verse number three, because the very first word in verse number three is a word we're very familiar with, and that's the word but. Somebody say but. Now, the word but is a conjunction. It joins two conditions together, but what we know about the word but is whatever said before, it usually gets overruled by what's said after it. Whatever said before the word but usually gets canceled out by what's said after that word but. It says in verse number three, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let's be very clear right here. All eyes up here do understand this. Jonah made a decision. Jonah made a choice. And Jonah chose to disobey God. Let me say that again. Jonah made a decision. Jonah made a choice. And his choice was to disobey God. Because God doesn't force you to do anything. God leaves it up to you to choose what you're going to do. And we see here Jonah chooses not to do what God told him to do. God can be your savior all you want, but if you still choose not to do what God said, God is just your savior, but he is not your Lord. Let me say that again. (laughs) He can be your savior all day long, but if you choose not to do what he's sending you to do, he may be your savior, but he may not be your Lord and savior. There are a lot of folks that want God to be their savior, but they don't want God to be their Lord. And so we see here, Jonah chooses not to do what God said. And like Jonah, you can justify it all you want, but at the end of the day, you make a choice whether or not you want to obey God or not. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are that lead up to that decision. Sooner or later, you've just got to admit whether or not you've obeyed God or have you disobeyed God. So here it is, here it is, here it is. The Word of God says, he went down to Joppa. And found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. We're going to go through a few consequences that come from your choices. And here's the first one. One bad choice has a tendency to lead to subsequent bad choices. I'll say that again. One bad choice has a tendency to lead to subsequent bad choices. We've all been there. You make one mistake, you make one bad decision, and then you find yourself making several more after that because you're trying to fix what you messed up, but then all the other subsequent bad decisions only make matters worse because one bad decision has a way of leading you to make other bad decisions. And Jonah, he decides to go in the opposite direction that God wants him to go in. God told him to go east. Jonah went west. God said, go to Nineveh, and Jonah said, no, I'm going to go to Tarshish. Jonah is representative of how some of us are with God. 
Some of us, we get down on our knees and want God to, God, you can use me how you want to use me. But when God wants to send you where he wants to send you, why you got to send me there? We want to go in the opposite direction of where God wants us to go. We want to do the opposite of what God wants us to do. And what we see here is Jonah is so bent on disobeying God that he's willing to pay a fare to disobey him. Jonah is so bent on doing opposite of what God said that he's willing to come out of his pocket, which leads us to the second consequence of your choices, and that's this. When you choose to disobey God, it's going to cost you. I'll say that again. When you choose to disobey God, it will cost you. We see here Jonah's paying a fare to flee from God, which further demonstrates Jonah's willingness to disobey God. And if at any time you want to disobey God, you got to know this. It's going to come at a price. God doesn't force you to do anything, but he purposely gives you the opportunity to make a choice. And when you choose to not obey God, it's going to cost you something. Watch this. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Verse 3 also shows us something about Jonah. Not only was he willing to pay to go to Tarshish in the opposite direction of where God was sending him, but we see something here. He's trying to flee the presence of the Lord. Here's the third consequence that comes from your choices, and that's this. A choice to disobey God pushes you away from the presence of God. A choice to disobey God pushes you away from the presence of God. All you got to do is watch kids. K kids have a way of reflecting our relationship with God. If you ever watch a kid do something that he or she knows they aren't supposed to do, the last thing they want to do is be around mom or daddy. If you told them don't mess with something and then they mess with it anyway, they don't want to be around you because they know they've done wrong. That sounds quite familiar, Jackie, because I believe in the Bible it says that God was walking in the cool of the morning and he's looking for Adam and Eve. But the word of God says that they hid from his presence. Why would you hide from the presence of God? You would if you knew that you did something you weren't supposed to do. Jonah knew he disobeyed God, and so he got on this boat well, going to Tarshish to flee from the presence of God. It's no wonder why some people don't come to church, because when they do wrong, they don't want to be around God. There's a wonder why some people don't pray, because when they start praying, they wanna, don't want their prayers interrupted, because God will say, hold up, you still haven't done what I've told you to do. There's a reason why some folk don't praise God, because he inhabits the praises of his people, and if I praise God, God, he just might interrupt my praise and remind me that there's still some things I need to be doing to please him. There's a reason why some folks don't want to be around God because when they get around God, they're constantly reminded of what God has been asking them to do. And here we find Jonah trying to get away from God. But how many know you can't get from God? Run all you want. But no matter where you go, God is right there. David said, I can make my bed in hell, and he's right there. David understood that I can't run from the presence of God. Well, watch verse 4. Verse 4 says, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Now, if you would uh, allow me to... We're just going to bypass verse 4 for the moment. We're going to come back and deal with it in a minute, but uh, we're gonna, there's a reason why we want to bypass it for this moment. Let's jump to verse 5. We're going to come back to verse 4 in a minute, but verse 5 says, Then the mariners were afraid and threw cargo into the sea. Here's the fourth consequence of your choice, and that's this. Not only will it cost you, but a choice to disobey God will cost those around you. Not only will you pay a price, but for those connected to you, they might be paying a price for your disobedience. Just like those connected to you can be blessed when you are right with God, there are those that may be cursed because you are not right with God. 
the Bible says that these mariners began to throw away what was valuable to them. They began to lose precious cargo because of someone else's disobedience. And maybe your children are catching it because you haven't done right with God. Maybe, maybe your spouse is struggling because you refuse to do what God has been telling you to do. Maybe the person closest to you is trying, scratching their heads trying to figure out what it is that they're doing wrong and why it is that they're going through what they're going through. And maybe it's because, not because of what they've done, but because they hooked up and connected with you. That's why you got to be careful with the company you keep. You might want to check your friends and say, baby, are you right with God? Because I can't be running with folks that ain't right with God. Because if you ain't right with God, then it's hurting me. These mariners are tossing over precious cargo. Then we find in verse 5 these words. Watch what it says here. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. <laughs> Look at verse 6. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Here's a warning for all of us. And the warning is this. Be careful not to get too comfortable in your disobedience to God. My God. My God. Be careful not to get too comfortable in your disobedience to God. <laughs> Everybody else is tossing stuff overboard, Lisa. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else on the boat, Deaconess Rogers, is praying to their God. Everybody else is evaluating what and why are we going through what we're going through. Everybody else is trying to figure out why are we in such a bad storm, yet one on that boat is not just sleep. He's fast asleep. One on that boat is not concerned about the storm. One on that boat is asleep, and while everybody else is freaking out, he sleeping soundly because you can get too comfortable in your disobedience to God so much so that you're okay and you sleep well at night while chaos is all around you you're sleeping because you know that you ain't right with God <laughs> and so they ask him man why, why are you sleeping why, why is it that you can sleep when everybody else is, uh, is tripping on this boat and so I'm going to get to that in a minute because when something else happens, they begin to draw straws to see who would jump off the boat. Everybody pulls a straw, and then Jonah pulls his straw. And when they look at him, he comes up with the short straw, <laughs> as if we ought to be surprised by that. And so we find here, look at this in verse 10. Watch this, verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. And said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Look at verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. Look at verse 12. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. I'm going to come down because I, God said I need to get, 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 get close up on you. <laughs> got to read that last part Jonah said. He said, look, look at what he says there. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Jonah does something here that many of us need to do a better job of. Jonah says... Throw me in the sea because I'm the cause of this trouble. Let me say that again, Deacon S. Rogers. Jonah said to these people, this storm we're in is because of me. And somebody needs to begin to just own up to the choices that you've made. I don't know who God's talking to, but some of you just need to just say, God, it ain't nobody else. It is me that I'm in this mess that I'm in. I made some bad decisions, and I need to own up to my decisions. I'm in debt because I made some bad financial decisions. I'm in a bad situation because I keep making the same bad choices. 
Too often, too often, we want to blame everybody else. We want to blame the people we work with. Them devils I work with, that's why I'm the way I am. No, no, you made some bad choices. We want to blame spouses. That's what Adam did. When God questioned him, he said, this woman you gave me got me all messed up, God. Instead of owning up to his choices, owning up to his decisions, which leads us to verse 12 again. Watch this. And he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. You missed it. I'm going to read it again. He said, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you. I kept reading that thing, and, and a couple of things jumped out at me. And here's the thing that jumped out at me the most. Jonah said, throw me in the sea because I'd rather die than do what God said. Good God Almighty. And there's some folks in here right now, you are going to go to your grave disobeying God. There's some of you right now, you, are, you know what God has been telling you to do, and you will rather die than do what God said. Let me tell you something about God. Let me tell you, I'm going to help somebody. I'm going to help somebody. God may have an assignment for you that you don't necessarily want to do. I'm going to say that. Let me come over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. God, God gives out assignments, but every assignment ain't an assignment everybody looks forward to doing. That's right. Amen. Right. Amen. And this was an assignment Jonah didn't want. Uh -huh. And he would have rather died than do what God said. Amen. So he said, you know what? Just throw me in. And the storm will stop for you. But I'm not so certain it's going to stop for me. But jump with me. Jump with me to verse 17 because uh, uh, jump with me to verse 17 because we, we're going to keep a promise. We, we're going to go back to verse 4 in a second. But look at verse 17. Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Y'all see that, right? Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Go, go, go back to verse 4. Rewind. Verse 4. Rewind. Verse 4. Verse 4 says, the Lord sent out a great wind. And there was a mighty tempest. It's going to mess somebody's religion up right here. Verse 4 says, the Lord sent out a great wind, and there was a mighty tempest. Verse 17 again says, now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Please get this. If you don't leave with anything else today, leave with this. Not once in Jonah's story is the devil's name brought up. Not once in all of the drama that Jonah was going through, do you hear anything about the enemy and what he's doing? Not once do you hear Satan's name mentioned because it wasn't Satan doing it, it was God doing it. Verse 4 is quite clear. Let's look at verse 4 again. It's quite clear. It says, and the Lord sent out a great wind. And there was a mighty tempest. Jump again at verse 17. Look again. It says, now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Maybe you ought to consider that you've been swallowed up by something because God prepared it for you. And maybe he prepared it for you because you refused to do what he's been telling you to do. And stop giving the devil credit for what God may be doing in your life. And maybe, just maybe, what you're going through is because of the devil, but because you aren't doing what God said. And Jonah does something that we need to understand. He tells these guys on the boat, you know what? <laughs> I know why I'm in this storm. I'm in this storm because I've disobeyed God. When you get a chance, here's your homework assignment. Homework on a Sunday? Homework. You got homework. Deuteronomy 28. When you get a chance, read Deuteronomy 28 in its entirety. What you'll find in Deuteronomy 28, not now, do it later, Deuteronomy 28, you'll find the first portion of that, that chapter talks about the blessings that come from obeying God. But then the next portion of that chapter talks about the curses that come from disobeying God. But notice, blessings or curses is up to you, you and your choices. Either way, the consequences, either good or bad, are going to be reflected on the choices that you make. Amen. Amen. And so, 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 so he gets swallowed up. He gets swallowed up. He gets, he gets caught up in this great fish. And 
I thought that wrapped up the message. I, I, I was done. I was, I was like, all right, Lord, you can whoop me. I'm cool because he whooped me too. And uh, so I figured, okay, God, you're done. But what I love about God is God will never break you down without building you back up. Thank you. Just like any loving parent, he might whoop you in one moment of the day, but the next portion of the day, those same hands that whooped you will wrap their arms around you and love you. I, what I love about God is he never leaves you broken and he never leaves you hurting. He always brings you back up if he's had to break. We all every now and then need to be corrected because the word of God says that if he loves you, he chastens you. If he loves you, he'll correct you. If he loves you, he'll put you in your place. We all need that from time to time. But what I love about God is he doesn't leave you after he's hurt you. Go, go, go with me to chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to shout now. We're about to shout now because I know it's been quiet, but how many want to shout? How many feel like shouting up in here? Watch this. Chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Let me set the story for you. He, he gets on this boat, Jonah does, going in the total opposite direction of where God tells him to go. Storm comes, and he gets, he gets tossed off the boat. As he gets tossed off the boat into the sea, a great fish comes and swallows him up. He's in that great fish for three days because he had disobeyed God. And then when he finally comes to terms and comes to grips with doing what God said, that great fish spits him out. How many know that just doesn't happen? But when you come to terms with doing what God said, God will spit you out of what swallowed you up. And so watch this. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. You're missing your praise right there. You're missing your praise right there. I'm going to say that again. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Uh, somebody going to get it in a minute. As disobedient as Jonah was, God gave him a word a second time. It's good God Almighty. He disobeyed God, but God says, I'm going to give you another chance to get right with me. He told Jonah, I'm going to give you another chance, even though you did the exact opposite of what I told you to do the first time. So I'm going to come around a second time and say, Jonah, I want you to go and do what I told you to do. I'm not going to take you out because you've got an assignment that I need you to fulfill. And I believe God's speaking to somebody today that he's giving you another chance to get right with him. He knows you've been out of whack. He knows you haven't done what he said. But God says, I'm going to come back around and I'm going to speak to your heart again. And I want you this time to accept what I've been telling you to do in the first place. And I believe that deserves a praise because God is more than just a God of a first chance or a second chance. God is a God of multiple chances. And God has given you more than one chance to get it right with him. Well, the word of the Lord says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Jonah. I want to take you out, but I ain't going to. Because you still got to do what I told you to do. Have you ever wondered how you keep making it through? God says, I still got an assignment for you. And you can keep fighting it all you want. But God says, the assignment won't change until you change. And so I'm going to be obedient. I'm almost done. But Jonah went through what he went through because he disobeyed God. Jonah made choices. And those choices had consequences. And nothing in this story had the devil's name on it. All of it was between Jonah and God. Obedience, all right. Disobedience, all hell breaking loose. He made some decisions, and those decisions 
led to the problems he had in his life. But I'm going to be obedient. God said, extend an altar call to those, and you know who you are, that God's been speaking to you to do some things that you haven't done. You've disobeyed God. God says, I want you to come to the altar. Now, if you're all right with God, stay where you're at. But if there's one, two, three, four, five of you, that you know you have not done what God has been telling you to do, get to this altar. Because God's going to have me share some things with you that he's already dealt with me on. I took my whooping Friday. I was in here Friday crying myself something crazy on this pulpit. Come on, this, this, this pulpit ain't going to hurt you. Come on a little closer. And God wants to speak to your life. The very things that I'm going to share with you are the very things that he wanted me to he share with me. Now, again, if you are with God, praise the Lord. But this is for those who you know that God has been pushing you and driving you to do a certain thing. And you haven't done it yet. And understand this, delayed obedience is just disobedience. And there's five things God wants me to share with you that help me and bless me. And uh, He wants me to share with you. First and foremost, God wants you to know that He's been the source of your trouble. Let me say that again. God's been the source of the trouble you're in. This ain't got nothing to do with the devil. God says, It's been me. As we saw with Jonah. He prepared a fish just for Jonah. He prepared a storm for Jonah because Jonah had disobeyed him. Second thing you got to know, and this is what God needs you to do. God needs you to own up to your disobedience. Now, whatever he's told you to do that you haven't done, that's between you and God. We don't need to know it. But he just needs you to own up to it. Right here, right now, at this altar, begin to own up to what you have not done that you know God has told you to do. Here's the third thing, and probably the most important thing that you need to hear today, is that God has already forgiven you. I believe that needs, God has already forgiven you. I believe that deserves a praise. God has already forgiven you. Fourth thing you need to know is your assignment is still waiting on you. Your assignment is still waiting. Have you ever wondered why God didn't replace Jonah? He didn't replace Jonah because that was Jonah's assignment. And God wants you to know your assignment is your assignment and nobody else's. But what we miss about that story, guys, what we miss about that story is this. The impatience that Jonah had with the Ninevites, he didn't see the patience God had with him. Good God Almighty. There was no grace in Jonah for Nineveh, but God had grace for him. And God wants you to know you've already been forgiven. But your assignment hasn't changed. It's still waiting on you. And then, finally, if you'll change your stance, God wants you to know your circumstance will change. Let me say it again. If you change your stance, God says your circumstance is going to change. 